Hello and welcome to Dorian's Mode. I am your host, Dorian Wallace, a composer, pianist, music therapist, and leftist shit talker who enjoys rambling about BS and conversing with my fellow humans about creativity, music, philosophy, politics, and nonsense in a casual, honest, and constructive way. Uh, yeah, so I did my first episode last week and um, doing the second one this week, uh, really using this to iron out some of the kinks uh, of just um, getting a better sound, getting a better flow of talking about various ideas um, and concepts. So I actually wanted I actually wanted to utilize this time to talk about some basic terms and concepts um, just because, you know, this show uh, obviously has a central space on music, uh, but it also has a lot of engagement within um, psychology and philosophy, science and politics. Um, so I just wanted to put some baseline definitions and concepts out there uh, just so that we are on somewhat of uh, the same page. Uh, so I guess first and foremost is, um, you know, what is music? And the, the way that I perceive music is that it's the art of arranging or organizing sounds through time uh, utilizing human intervention. And, you know, not everybody's going to agree with this definition. That's totally cool. But this is just sort of my analysis of the concept. Um, if a bird, for instance, is singing a song or, or, you know, making the sounds that birds make, I would not necessarily call that music. Um, because the bird is not expressing themselves in some form of artistic way. Now, when a sentient being perceives this sound, the sentient being can define this as music. So if the sentient being records this bird sound to listen to it, or transcribes it, or even just sits and enjoys it, or imitates it, anything, it has then transitioned to become music. This isn't an absolute, um, you know, and this could be ever changing. You know, the more sentient beings we come in contact, the more sentient beings we come across, the more likely that this definition can expand and change and process and all of this but really as a baseline for the conceptual ideas of this show music is the art of sound or organizing uh sorry the art of organizing or arranging sound through times by means of a sentient intervention um so <laughs> uh you know that's kind of a a a, a baseline area um I also wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of genre. Um, so when we define what a genre is, uh, it's almost, um, you know, it, it's a categorical term. Um, and it serves its purpose uh, in a lot of ways. And it's an essential part for descriptions and, and honest dialogue and all of this, but it can also become so micro defined that it uh, gets in the way of, of having a more curious uh, experience. So for instance, um, you know, an example I always think about is if we were to take a, a, a young let's say 25 year old African-American man from 1975 and we're able to transport this individual uh, in 1975 from Detroit. Like, let's just put it that way. Um, and 
this is a broad generalization, but if we were to take this individual and transport them to, to Japan, 1783, and we met a 36 year old woman and they were able to exchange the music that they find most important to them. Um, this, they, they may not define music in the same way. Um, I know I'm completely generalizing, but this is just to give some baseline concepts to begin discussion points. Um, so let's, let's transport now back to, to contemporary times, modern times. Um, the genres of music that I hear the most often where people say, I listen to everything, but the but is oftentimes metal or hip hop or country. Not always. I am broadly generalizing, but I listen to everything but hip hop. I listen to everything but country. I listen to everything but metal. This is fine. These are broad generalizations. And in fact, even within those genre spaces, there is so much diversity of sound and expression and technique and everything. So genre is, uh, is, is a little difficult to sometimes navigate through. Now, on the flip side of it, it's very essential. Uh, one way that I heard it described very well from a good friend of mine was he, he said that, you know, the Bill Evans trio is the worst death metal band I've ever heard. Uh, you know, and the, the concept behind that is uh, Bill Evans, you know, world renowned jazz pianist from 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, if you if I were to show his music to somebody who had never heard it before, um, you know, let's say like his his album um, Portraits in Jazz or, or Waltz for Debbie. Um, if I were to describe it to somebody who had never heard it, I would not use the word death metal, the words death metal or Norwegian black metal just wouldn't serve well. Um, on the flip side of it, like let's say, you know, I'm gonna show Cannibal Corpse to somebody who's never heard it before. And I say, yeah, this is like some of, the most dope uh, jazz fusion that's come out in a long time. It would not serve uh, explaining it in, a, in an honest way. Um, but so, yeah, genre is really a categorical term and it is used for certain ways and, and spaces and, and processes, uh, but it's not something um, that at least I'm going to get stuck in, um, meaning, you know, if somebody's genre of music that they're very into is deathcore, um, and I, I slip and say metalcore or something like that, um, that's not going to be something to get bogged down on, unless the dialogue is really meaningful for that particular space, but that's okay. Um, now, uh, another area to sort of think about is um, the areas of, of music that I specialize in. Um, and when I say specialize, I don't want it to come off in the, um, the capitalist way that we perceive the world where, um, where uh, you know, th this is sort of anti-great man theory. Um, but uh, it's really just the, the spaces that I've occupied the most in my life. And um, a lot of this is uh, what we would call contemporary classical music or, or new music is kind of the way we describe it amongst one another um, within, within the, the field. Um, and then I, I'll also say free jazz is a, another major space. But um, to give a little bit of clarity on where this comes from or why it's even described this way. Um, so classical music is a broad term. Um, it is often music uh, that 
uh, when, when, when we refer to classical, we're talking almost the broad spectrum of a give or take 500 to 1,000 year old tradition, um, maybe even longer than that, to be totally upfront. Um, but we're really talking about um, music that came post Renaissance in Europe. Um, and this is, uh, you know, particular genres such as the symphony or string quartet or piano trio or any of these sorts of spaces or opera is a, another subgenre that's commonly used uh, within classical music. Um, but uh, there is a particular tradition um, that has continued on and there are people who still identify and work as composers um, in this tradition of European classical music. Um, now it gets a little, uh, you know, interesting because there is also, you know, we will sometimes say Indian classical music, and that is the same uh, formal conceptual ideas that comes out of India. Uh, though it's a completely different um, tradition, different format, different growth, all of these sorts of things. But uh, so a contemporary classical composer or a new music composer, um, often uh, the definition has expanded, you know, like what we even consider uh, from the canon, quote unquote, of classical music. Um, you know, and I'll just give an example. So I'm a huge fan of the early 20th century works of Béla Bartók and Igor Stravinsky and Charles Ives, Arnold Schoenberg. But I also have a deep love and understanding of the works by Sun Ra or Ornette Coleman or, uh, you know, any, any of this, these particular spaces, Craig Taborn in a you know, contemporary sense. Um, but it gets even more expansive uh, when, you know, I'm really influenced by hip hop music and it can be anything as, you know, mainstream and brilliant as Kendrick Lamar or, or Jay-Z. Uh, but there's also Jedi Mind Tricks or Immortal Technique or Dead Prez. Like there are all these spaces that, um, that I musically occupy. Um, you know, I have a deep, deep love of extreme metal. I love Meshuggah, I love Slayer, um, you know, and, and keep in mind right now, I'm kind of giving the, the obvious choices for those that aren't familiar with these subgenres or these, these spaces of music, uh, you know, as kind of baseline spaces to check out. So, so to summarize, Contemporary classical music is known as new music within, um, within the scene. Um, and it is contemporary compositional work often informed by the European classical tradition. But as with everything in a more uh, globally connected world, the information, the, 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 the legacy is expanding. Um, so, yeah. Um, so then I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the other space, which is um, impro improvised music. And, um, you know, one of the areas that I have a particular interest in is, um, we'll call it free jazz, which is, it's an experimental approach to jazz uh, that really developed in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, sometimes we call it avant-garde or, or free improvisation. Um, yeah, the, but it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, deep tradition. Um, some of the masters in this practice are um, Paul Blay, Clara Blay, Ornette Coleman, Sun Ra. Uh, Pharaoh Sanders is a really, really important um, thinker and, and interpreter in this world. Uh, Cecil Taylor is one of my all-time favorites, um, really, really brilliant pianist. Um, but the whole point is that uh, this is music expressed 
for its uh, the purpose of, of expression in and of itself. And it sometimes doesn't sound very good to the, we'll call it the unlearned ear. Um, I don't want to say untrained because that implies that you have to go through formal training to develop an understanding of this. Sometimes it's simply opening up that part of your mental processing or your brain processing to hear this music for what it is trying to express. Um, yeah, uh, really, really great album to check out just to get a basic idea is The Shape of Jazz to Come, which is Ornette Coleman's um, incredible, incredible work. Uh, and just sit down and listen to it. Um, yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, so I'm just going to, for sake of time, um, move into music therapy, uh, just to give a bit of an explanation on, on what the fuck this is all about. Um, so music therapy, it's an evidence-based clinical approach of utilizing music interventions with the purpose of accomplishing individualized goals within some kind of therapeutic relationship or therapeutic alliance. And um, in the modern sense, uh, you have to go through a credentialed um, uh, program um, at an approved music therapy program. So for instance, I went to Montclair State University. Uh, there's also a really great music therapy program at New York University. Uh, there's one at Temple. There's actually one that developed at Berkeley College of Music. Um, but there's a lot of different spaces of music therapy uh, that accompany um, various, uh, various medical and clinical spaces. Um, the four, we'll call them the four pillars of music therapy are improvisation, composition, lyric analysis, and music listening. Um, and the way that these work, and this is a baseline understanding, but improvisation is working with a client and improvising with them in a complete free form manner. Um, or, you know, sometimes if you've got somebody who may have a bit more knowledge or understanding, they may um, have some blues background or some rock background or, you know, anything like that, hip hop background. Um, but improvisation is the act of spontaneously creating music together um, or creating music in the moment. Um, composition uh, is, you know, it's the same as songwriting. It's, it is the act of creating music uh, that will live on. So it is not just within the moment, but it can be recreated or performed in other places or spaces. So this is writing a composition, writing a song, um, anything in that sort of realm or space. Uh, and then lyric analysis, this is the um, looking at lyrics of a song and utilizing uh, what the song may be expressing or the song may be bringing out or, or, or uh, guiding through um, the unconscious space. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a, a use of, of lyric analysis. And then, um, and then finally is uh, music listening. And um, music listening, it's, uh, we call it receptive music therapy, but it's, it's listening to music, listening to, to the experience and, and exploring what may arise uh, within the unconscious mind or maybe utilizing it for, for stress reduction or we call it rhythmic entrainment, which is the unconscious uh, physical reaction to sound. Um, and this is used a lot in um, physical therapy and occupational therapy and all these sorts of spaces. Um, but aside from you know, the musical elements, uh, it's also very informed by uh, some psychological concepts. And, uh, you know, there is psychotherapy, which was um, 
really a revolutionary form of therapy that was really innovated by Sigmund Freud, um, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and just to clarify, uh, Freud is actually not taken very seriously yet. Um, he's, uh, he's an important figure. I'll say like, obviously, duh. Um, but some of his theoretical orientations are very outdated and we're coming from a very unscientific place. Uh, but what he did revolutionize, um, the first and foremost is the actual technique of talk therapy. Um, he learned that with his patients, when they were able to turn their back to him, you know, the famous image of the person laying on the couch and Freud sitting behind them, when they were not making physical eye contact with somebody, they were able to express their inner feelings in a different way. And he was able to, as a secondary set of eyes or a set of ears, uh, help them process through uh, their inner life. Um, and the other major innovation was his uncovering of the unconscious, which is our deeper hidden space within the mind. Um, now, there is at this point in time some really good neurological uh, neuroscience evidence of the unconscious mind. Um, there's a really great book that I, it's called The Unconscious that was just, just came out in the, uh, 2020, I think. Um, I'll see if I can remember it and put a link in the show notes. Um, but uh, there is scientific evidence of the unconscious being a real thing. Uh, but to really summarize how the unconscious works, um, when, you know, for instance, you are asleep and uh, let's say a mosquito lands on your face while you're sleeping, the individual does not wake up and, um, and engage uh, with the mosquito. Their body intuitively reacts by swatting the mosquito away while still being asleep. This is the unconscious mind at work. It is the connection to our entire nervous system. Um, and this is one reason why insight meditation is such a uh, practical, tangible approach to meditation is because you are simply becoming in tune and aware of your unconscious processes and anything that your nervous system is connecting to. Um, another school of thought uh, within, within the psychological lens is existential psychology. And this is really applying the theoretical orientations of the philosophy of existentialism to a, through a psychological framework. So, um, this is things like coming to terms with the concept of freedom, the concept of responsibility, uh, the concept of death or mortality, and then the concept of meaning or the meaning of life. And so when you're working with a patient through an existential lens, you are really looking at these four dimensions of how one engages with the world. And it's a simple question with profound, profoundly difficult answers. Um, you know, another way to think about it is almost, you know, why do we feel the need to be right in air quotes? Or why do we feel insecure when somebody is doing something successful like where does this jealousy come from what is our relationship with death as a culture um when i was working uh in hospice care for my internship uh one of the terms i heard from one of the the doctors was that the united states um has an existential existential denialism um, we do not like to face death and, you know, it's a complicated philosophical question or, uh, that doesn't necessarily have 
concrete answers at this point in time, but this is uh, the space that we're occupying. Um, another school of thought or another theoretical orientation is humanism. And this was uh, really, um, well, so this humanism, the philosophical outlook, which is um, engaging with the world through a human centered lens or or, or, or uh, to put it to put it maybe in a better way is we're not really concerned about supernatural or gods or goddesses or things like that. We are experiencing the world um, as a sentient being here and now, and that really came out of the Renaissance. You know, one of the famous examples is uh, early on is Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. Um, but. As a psychological approach, it was uh, really revolutionized by Carl Rogers. And this is where you observe the individual not as separate parts, but in fact, as, uh, as a whole being, meaning that an individual uh, may be coming from an abusive background or uh, may be struggling with addiction or um, you know, any, any spaces, you know, that, that we may occupy. Um, and the humanistic approach is to look at the individual, not as, as they have ADHD. Therefore it is ADHD is a sim simply a part of their lived experience and, and the humanistic approach is to examine it through that lens. Um, and then the third kind of school of thought, I guess, for, I don't know. I don't even know what number I'm on, whatever. But uh, it's the transpersonal psychology. And this is the use of um, mystical experiences or uh, what we call transpersonal experiences. And um, this is, uh, you know, we might call it an altered state of consciousness or a non-ordinary state, uh, depending on which school of thought you're kind of coming from more specifically. Um, but these altered states of consciousness, it can be anything from... Uh, taking a psychedelic um, drug or substance, um, you know, a psychoactive substance such as alcohol or marijuana. Um, it can be involved in prayer. It can be having sex. It can be reading a book, but anything in which you are sensing a non-ordinary state or an altered state of consciousness um, transpersonal psychology is really going into that space and utilizing it as a healing practice. Um, so I hope, I hope this gives a little bit of a baseline understanding of music therapy, um, or at least the schools of thought uh, that, that are kind of worked with through music therapy. Uh, I'm sure more stories will come along as the podcast goes, but uh, I also wanted to just get into um, sort of the basic understandings of um, the political ideology that I um, sort of float around with or work with. <clears throat> um, so as a baseline, you know, I, I'm, I'm some kind of socialist and, you know, to be upfront, I'm very much for a unified left. So meaning that I will work with people in the Democratic Party here in the United States, um, a party that I consider to be right-wing, um, socially liberal, uh, but not left-wing really in the slightest, minus a couple of members of uh, Congress, such as Alexander Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders, who are really social democrats they're not um they're not radical left-wingers um but uh i guess the the basic way to to discuss what is socialism because it's such a such a weird uh intentional diversion um in the united states especially uh but a socialist is somebody who is either completely anti-capitalist or has an issue 
with capitalism. So the definition that I um, like to use is socialism is a diverse socioeconomic philosophy encompassing many systems typified by collective ownership of production and democratic authorization, such as worker self-management of organizations. Participation in collective ownership can take form of public collective cooperative or equity participation. Anarchism, Marxism, democratic socialism, social democracy, Leninism, Maoism, libertarian socialism, utopianism, scientific socialism, religious socialism, syndicalism, and various social movements are examples of socialist perspectives and movements. So to get into some of this, uh, I do not trust the capitalist system. Um, and the reason I really uh, have major issue with it is the way that power is distributed, meaning that um, there is a myth uh, that if you work hard, everything will pay off. Uh, but the whole point is that you work hard. And, and, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't work hard. And I'm not just saying that, um, that uh, working hard won't pay off. What I am saying is that there is a systemic issue in which the class you are born into or the, the ethnicity you are born into or the gender or the sex that you are born into has an impact that affects where your social standing is and what opportunities you actually have access to. Um, I also have a major issue with capitalism because the very apparent side effects um, are climate change, war, privatization of the mental health industry, and wealth inequality. Um, these are all areas of why I have an issue with capitalism. Um, you know, I've got my ideological self, which is an anti-capitalist, but I'm also very willing to work within the system that exists uh, to get some form of reform. Um, and the purpose of this is that there are people who, have, who are really suffering um, due to the systemic issues we have. Um, we are a gigantic uh, internationally co connected um, world and uh, we have um, exploited resources uh, and exploited people as a commodity all over the world. Right now it's happening and um, we're having environmental distress and, and this is something that needs to be fought. Um, so in a very broad sense, um, I kind of float around uh, three sort of ideological spaces within socialism. Um, and, you know, uh, as I said earlier, like I'm open to social democracy, which is uh, really it's a that's a capitalist system with uh, heavy emphasis on social programs. That's what they have in um the Nordic countries, uh, and you know, I'm I'm open to that. I am open to it, but uh, for more philosophical purposes, um, I tend to float around anarchism, uh, Marxism, and social ecology. Um, now, anarchism is simply a political philosophy that rejects unjustifiable hierarchical structures. And it has a heavy advocacy sense for the liberation from bureaucratic systems um, that are often considered inadequate, obsolete, and even harmful. Um, now, there are a couple of, uh, I'll put air quotes up, anarchist societies that are doing quite well uh, right now. Um, that is the Zapatista movement in Mexico as well as um, Rojava in Syria. Um, but I utilize anarchism as a baseline principle um, in that the purpose of the ideological framework is horizontalism, meaning that everyone has a say, 
everyone may participate with what they're capable of participating with, and that we cannot move to a consensus until we have heard from everybody. That is a baseline concept. It is unrealistic in a lot of ways. And I see that and I understand that. Um, it is much better for smaller communities. Um, but that being said, it is still a space that I utilize as my, my, my baseline for my ideological framework. Um, now, I'm now going to talk about Marxism and Marxism is, especially if you're in the United States, is a loaded term that it shouldn't be. Um, but Marxism is simply a method of socioeconomic analysis that applies a materialist interpretation of historical development to understand class relationships and social conflict and a dialectical perspective when examining social transformation. So this was really the philosophy of Karl Marx. Um, and the, the way to kind of process it as its baseline is we observe the world through a historical lens, um, meaning that uh, we look at why something in a tangible way, not necessarily an ideological way, but in a tangible way, why did something take place? Um, so, you know, we could, we could, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a very good example that there are podcasts that do a much better job of explaining this. Um, okay, uh, I'll put a music perspective on it. So um, a, an ideological framework that we may look at is somebody like Mozart was a musical genius and it was his sheer talent and will that got him to be a, a namesake. Um, Yet if we look at it through a historical materialist lens, um, we see that he came from a family that already had connections to music and the royalty class. And we see that he had a father who violently pushed him and trained him to uh, really work hard uh, at developing the skill of music but it was most likely an abusive relationship. Um, so yes, was Mozart talented? Uh, and did he have brilliance? Yes, he was. But he was not necessarily better than other composers or even people who may have had um, some innate quality or, or skill, but it was through his material advantages that uh, he was able to actually get into the 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 limelight, as you say, um, and so so that that's sort of a really bad <laughs> generic way of explaining historical materialism um, and the basic concept of, of Marxism. Um, so yeah, so historical materialism is a framework for understanding human cultures and their evolution across time, proposing that historical social structural changes emerge from material and technological conditions rather than ideologies. And then the dialectical materialism is a historical analysis and philosophy of science that emphasizes the importance of real world conditions and contradictions within and around class, labor, and socioeconomic relationships. So this means that there is a constant push and pull as we move through history. So that is the general gist of Marxism. Um, now, the reason it's complicated uh, to use that term without any explanation is that there is um, various schools of thought, some of which uh, came out in real world practices uh, through Marxist Leninism. And within those, uh, those social spaces, there were some very, very horrible um, atrocities that came about. But 
uh, by applying historical materialist lens, uh, we see that it is not quite as simple as um, the ideology or the concept is, is bad. Uh, and what I mean by this is that, um, you know, like let's take Cuba for instance. Um, Cuba has been blocked from trading with most of the world because the United States has, has, has done this and, and encouraged other nations to do so. And so resources become scarce within Cuba. There cannot be any trade. And so there is a large amount of poverty in Cuba. And this is, util this is um, expressed through a propagandized lens that the material conditions are, this is proof that communism or Marxism does not work. But <laughs> there were intentional blocks to make sure that it didn't work from outside forces. And so this is just, this is just something to consider. Um, and then last but not least, uh, there is um, uh, blah, 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 social ecology. And this is um, really from a philosopher um, named Murray Bookchin, who I'm a, a big fan of his writing. But uh, social ecology is a philosophical theory investigating the relationship underlining social and environmental crises, emphasizing ecological concerns due to social issues, such as various types of hierarchy and domination. And it utilizes dialectical naturalism, which examines the complex interrelationship between societal problems and the direct effects of human society's ecological footprint. A good example is there is mass migration happening right now in the year 2021. And uh, this is direct results of ecological change from climate change. There are, uh, we're having spaces of the earth that are heating and we are having wildfires. There are spaces of the world that are flooding. So this is a direct social impact of having unregulated capitalism, um, putting basically emissions into, into the atmosphere, uh, causing serious disruption of the ecological system and it is causing ecological disasters that is thus having an impact on social changes again and so social ecology is just a really good framework for analyzing um the specifics of of um of uh, sociological and ecological changes and shifts. And, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than this, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to get people on um, that we can uh, have these discussions. And yeah, so I guess, uh, ugh, sorry, it's like fucking early on a Saturday morning when I'm recording this, but um I guess to really summarize uh, why I felt the need to do uh, these sort of baseline explanations is um, I hope that people will hear this episode, um, A, to just let me know if the, uh, if the, the audio quality has gotten better, um, but B, uh, to also give just a baseline on um, some of the the talking point. So it doesn't necessarily have to be explained um, in the episodes as I'm talking to people or exploring different concepts and talking points. Um, yeah. And, you know, just to kind of give some insight, uh, just, you know, for the final concept on like why I find all of these areas important. Um, you know, so first and foremost, musically, I, I think creativity is an essential part of the human experience. And music happens to be the area in which I have the most experience with. And I may have some innate uh, ability, but I also was in an environment which allowed it to, to grow and prosper in a certain way, um, including the friend groups that I hung out with or the family I was born into or the the 
just environment of spaces I was at. Um, you know, just to give an example, I don't think I'd ever be a pianist if we didn't have a piano in the house. That was a material reason that I became a pianist. Um, you know, so I find creativity to be an essential part of the human experience. We've been utilizing music since the Paleolithic era. We've been utilizing it just like we've been utilizing language or mathematics or dance or any other abstract concept. It's a part of us and it's just in there. And we live in a culture that snuffs out the creativity unless the creativity is uh, utilized to exploit. <laughs> and so I want to get other forms of creativity out there and talking. Um, and then, you know, the therapeutic lens, you know, we really should be taking care of each other. And by understanding, um, you know, we can get past the bullshit. Sometimes you have to break through the, the mental blocks that we put up. And, you know, I'm a very, very big supporter of um, therapy, um, some form of wellness practice and medication. And I know that there are some major issues, some major issues with the pharmaceutical industry, but I put that blame on more systemic issues, capitalist issues uh, than um, necessarily the individuals involved uh, within the field. Because I will tell you up front, um, I have post-traumatic stress disorder and atypical depression, um, which has affected my life in horrifying ways. Um, most of which are panic attacks and procrastination. It's all related to anxiety and depression. And I was able to find a psychiatrist and work with them over a period of four to six months where I took the medicine that we tried and I was on an exploratory journey with him to really let it settle in so I could make a good and informed decision to help even out my baseline um, biological issues to then have a much safer space to utilize therapy to practice my processing mechanisms or uncover my processing mechanisms as well as a very serious meditation practice on developing a spiritual relationship or or um, a dynamic grounding to, to myself and, and my community and my universe, um, you know, which is very yin and yang. Um, and then the reason for the politics is, um, you know, if we look at the 20th century as a battle of three different ideologies, it was uh, communism, capitalism, and fascism. And I am not sure any of the authoritarian means of any of them work. I think fascism is by far the most existentially dangerous, but I think capitalism is also incredibly dangerous. And I have major issues with historical re uh, areas of communism, but I do think that there are other ways of approaching a more communal way of living um, that can really be broken through and so that's why i want to have these conversations uh to sort of clear up some of these these misconceptions and uh really have a space where we can explore the human to human contact um through cre creativity and uh and, and politics uh so yeah so with all that being said, um, thank you all so much for taking a listen. Again, my name is Dorian Wallace. This is Dorian's Mode. Um, I'm involved with a musician's co-op called Ampled. Ampled is a Patreon-like platform for musicians collectively owned by its artists and workers. So I am a co-owner. 
Ampled empowers artists to receive direct community support without intermediaries or gatekeepers. You can become a supporter for whatever amount you think the show is worth. Supporters gain access to exclusive content, including work in progress recordings, backstage events, and sneak peeks at upcoming projects. The average supporter gives $6.50 a month, so that's $6.50. Um, which, yeah, I mean, what is that? 13 times 6, why do I suck at math? Why am I recording myself being bad at math? Um, that is, uh, that is $78 a year, um, which is the average, but you can donate, uh, less than that, you know, $3 a month, for instance, is $36 a year, um, which is a $20 bill, a $5 bill, a $10 bill, and a $1 bill. You put it out in a weird order, whatever. Um, but yeah, please be a supporter if you find this uh, this podcast helpful. Um, and then also check out my weekly Twitch show, uh, Socialist Psychedelia Music Hour, which streams every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at www.twitch.tv slash Dorian Wallace. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, on YouTube, please like and subscribe. For more information regarding my compositional or therapeutic work, please visit my websites at www.dorianwallace.com and www.madarimusic.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I music.com. Thank you all. Have a good one. Peace.